Hello everyone and thanks for tuning in. My name is Vivian Roberts and I'm co-founder and artistic director at Aleph Contemporary. Today it is my great pleasure to introduce our two speakers, Dr. Kamini Velodi, in conversation with Lawrence Noga about his virtual solo exhibition online at Aleph Contemporary. Lawrence Noga is an artist, curator and writer. He lives and works in London. His paintings and constructions combine an industrial and geometric aesthetic with more personal themes and undercurrents. A sense of history comes from collective and individual memories as many of the elements such as the support of the painting are from his father's collection of objects and memorabilia in his garage. Hundreds of tools, packets, washers, menus, books and photographs. Their selection and use activates an open approach reliant on the environment and experimentation, alongside a human response to the mysterious and forgotten items and their poetic sense of history. A long-term interest in the Bauhaus, particularly Moholy Nagy, Joseph Albers and Paul Clay, drives the unpredictability, predictability of the color handling and surface facture. Lawrence Noga currently teaches at University of the Arts London, Camberwell. He graduated from Wimbledon College of Art and completed his postgraduate studies at Byam Shaw, Central St. Martin's University of the Arts London in 1991, receiving the Postgraduate Award of Merit for Fine Art. Kamini Velodi is a writer and artist and senior lecturer in philosophy, theory and history of art in Edinburgh College of Art at the University of Edinburgh. Her research intersects 20th century and contemporary continental philosophy and theory, and theories and historiographies of art history and visual culture. She is the author of Tintoretto's Difference, Deleuze, Diagrammatics and Art History, published by Bloomsbury in 2019, and is series editor of Refractions at the Borders of Art History and Philosophy for Edinburgh University Press. She studied painting at the Royal College of Art and Chelsea College of Art and holds a PhD in philosophy from the Center for Research in Modern European Philosophy, Middlesex University. She is currently working on two books, one on the concept of gray in art and philosophy after Hegel and the other a dictionary on Deleuze and Guattari's writings on the visual arts. Okay, hello. Um... I'm really thrilled to have been invited by Lawrence and Vivian to write the catalogue text for this show and to have the opportunity to engage now um, in a dialogue with Lawrence um, about it. Uh, yesterday, Lawrence and I met for a preliminary chat about what we might discuss today, and we thought we might structure this dialogue um, in, into four parts. Uh, beginning with some brief reflections on the show and then moving on to the question of memory and obsolescence, followed by thinking a bit more closely about the relation between symbolism and formalism in, in, in the works, and finally um, turning to the, the question of um, time and the instant. So hopefully we'll have we'll have time for all those things. Um, but I thought so maybe we can just start very simply with talking about the works and, and the installation, what's in the show in an empirical way. And maybe Lawrence, you could just tell us a little bit about, about the specific group, for instance, was it conceived as a singular body of works? Well, the, the works were conceived um, partly as a singular body, but also um, the work has a kind of sense of history to it. So I think the that history is kind of the relationship really between the works. Uh, and I, I think that's probably at the core of the kind of show, um, particularly in terms of the kind of construction of the work and the kind of idea of the memory that's lodged within the work. Uh, so that, yeah, that really kind of uh, identifies how I probably decided to put the work together. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of the, the, the work itself, um, uh, they very much come from um, my own memories, uh, I suppose, that um, take me back in time uh, quite a long way um, to my childhood home. Um, 
and my father's garage in particular, um, where um, he was he was in a kind of obsessive collector of memorabilia, and um, really he he um, collected many things from the restaurant he worked. It was the Caprice restaurant in the, in the West End. Um, so old old menus, that kind of idea, bits and pieces he found around the restaurant, but also um, you know from other places he went. Uh, he did a lot of gardening, so he collected little things from probably people's sheds. So for instance, there were hundreds of packets lined up across the garage, uh, quite systematically, I have to say. So they just weren't randomly placed. They were quite systematically kind of ordered. So I kind of, I think, I think there was science, some kind of system in his head. Uh, and then doorknobs, he was really interested in doorknobs. So he'd have these kind of collection of doorknobs, again, systematically placed through color, through kind of size and scale. Um, and they were kind of, um, yeah, actually even sort of placed quite strategically on, on kind of a wood support in the space as well. And then on top of that, there were just hundreds of tools as well, um, which kind of were stacked on long shelves and all around the space. So these kind of tools, if you were, kind of stayed with me. Um, and his father was a carpenter before that. So this kind of idea of um, uh, you know, shared experience is one that certainly kind of came passed down to me. And perhaps, on, on, you know, as, as well as that, my um, my mum was a singer, a jazz singer. So we had this kind of also lots of uh, musicality uh, in the garage as well, old speakers, plenty of old music scores. Um, she was, she was interested in jazz, so lots of improvisation, music, um, uh, and, you know, and, and, and standard things that she'd sing. So there was this kind of, uh, yeah, this mixture of, of kind of identity that uh, the garage kind of held in a way. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, you speaking sort of about, you know, yes, yeah, so we were talking about the found object and the way in which there was a particular kind of horizon of that for you, because what's found is sort of found in the garage in a site um, and that site is loaded you know um, with, 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 with these memories with these very specific uh, life story um, and so this is already a kind of maybe an imminent sort of systematization to the found object I'm really fascinated by the fact that the packet's already arranged and there's a kind of the hint of the form to come or something like that. Um, and, and, and that constructivism is somehow suggested by the kind of the tool or the thing that's found. Is, 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 that, is that a fair way to do, maybe describe it or begin a description? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, I, I know when uh, I left the house with, with, with my dad, you know, um, we, we took everything with us and I just boxed everything up and um, I just took it away with me and put it in my studio. And uh, over time, I kind of began to, you know, kind of undo the boxes and um, start, you know, finding what was in the boxes. Um, and yeah, you know, sort of surprising, you know, things that were in there, um, just because I, I, I didn't know how I'd kind of, I, because I'd packed them up quickly. Um, yeah, suddenly I was kind of, this whole kind of new horizon of things emerged. Um, mm. But then after he, he kind of passed away, I started using them, um, you know, very much in, in response to that memory, I guess. And um, the sort of physicality of those shapes um, probably directed, started to direct the work. Um, for instance, there was a, a semi-circular uh, uh, shape that was part of a bar in the uh, restaurant he used to work in. And um, so I attached that to one of the paintings uh, quite intuitively in a way. Um, mm. And um, other, yeah, other items like, as I said, mentioned the doorknobs, those things are kind of creeping in perhaps behind me here a little bit. Um, washers, those kinds of things. I think this kind of sort of momentum, sort of color mementos kind of you know, crept in as well. So um, I suppose this amalgamation of kind of collage uh, was beginning to kind of, um, have a depth of kind of, of um, yeah, quality and a depth that started to um, develop the, the structures. Mm. 
it's, I mean, it's really interesting what this, the notion of a color memento, um, because I think symbolism here, you know, already takes on two registers, both the kind of visual the qualities, properties, but this is very sort of very specific, very loaded, and you know, uh, associations. Um, and I was also struck by the what you talk about there's a sort of the, redis the rediscovery. So the kind of you know that that somehow you know it seems interesting to me that things have been packaged and maybe not forgotten, but sort of put aside and then rediscovered. So you know that there's a sort of uh, yeah, a kind of return to the site um, that's that's displaced and not not there. And construction or constructivism also then takes on a, a different type of dimension. Um, you know, it is, it's certainly beyond the sort of not only about formal assemblages, um, but symbolic ones too. No, I, I'm in tune with that really. I think that kind of symbolism um, in terms of those objects is, you know, again. Um, have equal weight, you know, I think there's equal weight between the sense of symbolism and equal weight with the kind of more constructive um, approaches that I use in, in the making of the work. Um, mm. Perhaps mm. it's, you know, perhaps, perhaps I, that weight is, a, is, you know, is quite an intuitive thought to begin with. And then as the work start to kind of develop, and they're quite slow, I'd say, to a certain extent, um, you know, they, they probably take sort of months in some ways, maybe even longer, just because I, I work on, you know, probably a number at a time, but then I get generally probably stuck on one, uh, like, like this one that you talked about here. Um, again, I, I think I, I've come back to that a lot. It's, you know, it's had lots of different phases where it was just wood uh, in, in the bottom part of it. And then I thought, Actually, I, I'm sort of starting. I, I quite like to see what happens if I paint it. So I, that started happening, and then I, I kept building quite slowly the layers on the, on the top part of it as well. So um, that's often done with kind of things, you know, palette knives, um, quite soft brushes. So again, those that kind of very slow, methodical kind of build up of the structure of it. Um, mm, yeah. mm. It, it's a line for the whole cut those two two ways of thinking mm, mm. I mean, there's uh well there's two things i want to ask you <laughs> so, i mean what one is about i guess the, the the selection the way you decide what objects to select um when you know you have this massive <laughs> reservoir of possible objects and whether there is a a kind of visual and material language that you're you're working with and you've you've constructed over the years, and that's that's also part of the um, not predetermination, but the kind of uh, the shape uh, shaping of what you decide to select. And the other the other question, I guess, um, is about it's it's, a, it's about the tipping point between constructivism and pictorialism. Um, we started to talk a little bit about this yesterday. Um, because that, that seems to be really key here that, you know, you're constantly negotiating um, a boundary, you know, you could call it the boundary between object and, uh, and, and pictorialism as well, um, or other things. And I remember you said something about, was it the constructions as questions and the paintings as, um, as uh, statements, which, which struck me at the time. So yeah, <laughs> maybe you could answer. Yeah, I, I think the kind of the constructions ask questions of the past and and time. You know that that, that I think that's very much how they kind of operate, and um, and also you know the, the the time and spent making them. I think that the sort of painting side of it and the kind that that also is referential to sort of weight of color. I think. Um, you know, it might be, for instance, you know, you know I'm quite interested in, in how greys balance off primary, secondaries, tertiary colours balance off that. So I'll, I'll use a lot of greys, blacks in the work to kind of counter that all the time. And also the sense of um, perhaps um, thinking about uh, quite punctuating colour, like perhaps pinks. You know, the way a pink might kind of really shift the way uh, the paintings understood from front to back 
So there's the, I, I, that, that's something I, I often use to kind of articulate a kind of depth of space um, mm. or a really kind of quite sharp lemon yellow, which again will kind of facilitate that, that depth of um, understanding in, in the work. Um, mm. I mean, I always referred to the sort of my work in a way as a is sort of a peripheral. It's kind of got and and the geometry is quite imperfect. So, in a way, there's there's some slippage quite often with the paint. It's it's not always totally hard edge. It has it has those softer moments. Um, I mean, I use quite a lot of masking tape, but there's quite a lot of freehand um, approaches in the painting as well. Mm. So that, those combinations are always kind of happening for me. Um, mm. Mm. I'm going to pick up on what you just said about grey there. <laughs> I think you know what's coming. This, this idea of uh, we were talking about uh, Paul Clay yesterday and the Bauhaus, your interest in the Bauhaus and constructivism and, uh, and Bauhaus colour theory. And um, uh, something I've been interested in is, is uh, Paul Clay's uh, notion of grey, the grey point as the tipping point between uh, chaos and composition, the kind of uh, punctum of pictorial genesis. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, you know, do you, do you invest particular colors? You just talked about the sort of uh, the hinge between the primaries and the secondaries, and that's how Clay saw gray um, because it had no opposite, which is also something I guess, sort of useful in thinking about genesis, that there was a way of thinking about genesis as a reservoir where all potentials are somehow contained, which in some peculiar way also brings us back to the idea of a, a garage as a sort of yeah. reservoir where <laughs> lots of potentials, potentialities are contained, um, maybe many further into the future one doesn't know about. Um, is, that, is that something that occurs to you, that kind of investment of uh, of colour or, or sort of spatial uh, uh, particularities of the work as punctum or tipping points or, you know, catalyst. Yeah, no, I think the work, well, I often use greys in for the grounds as well. So mm -hmm. that often activates the whole style of the painting anyway. Um, uh, sometimes I, um, I'll use, um, uh, an emulsion ground because again I quite like that sense of flatness to start the painting um, so I might I might use that um, I'm always looking for a kind of whole range of kind of gray tones and dark tones because on my well I'm sitting at my table but again kind of laid out on the whole table I kind of I guess I reset it most days but there are kind of 20 or 30 grays kind of lined up on the table um, mm. with Table, so I can just push around the studio. But um, yeah, so they kind of they're always there, balanced against the rest of the color that I might use. So mm -hmm. it's kind of always kind of that that the possibility of that of, of that kind of color slipping in. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe even silvers, you know, as well, kind of more iridescent color. Um, what does it do? Is it a neutralizer? Or is it is it a reservoir? I think, it, 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 I think it's a counterbalance, really. Mm -hmm. I, I think. Um, and also it creates this odd depth of field, I think, you know, if you think mm. of sort of more um, lens media where you might use kind of a black and white kind of um, structure in, 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 a, in a photograph, then I quite like that depth, that odd depth of field um, that perhaps the greys, grey tonal shifts will create. Mm. Um, so perhaps that's something that, um, that or, or kind of sudden density, you know, that really acts, that will be helped by that, those grey tones. That's really interesting. And, and also, I suppose there's something about grey because it, it doesn't declare itself, it allows other things to be declared. Um, you know, so it's a, it's a, it is, as you say, a perfect ground, but it, it's a mobiliser. So I think, you know, that's what interests me about the way Claire uses it. It's a sort of, it is an activator without actually calling any attention to itself. So it suspends well, I... itself while pointing to other things. <laughs> No, I think that you're absolutely right. I, you know, that that kind of um, arrow to that to that uh, to that particular color. Um, I mean, you know, Clay actually uses arrows in his paintings, so I mm -hmm. often use this kind of pointed mark. But um, 
I mean, I'm also interested in the way that the, the kind of greys might be sandwiched between the colours. You know, mm. perhaps it's, you know, it's, it's in a clay, it might be sandwiched between some chalk, some gouache, some watercolour, some, you know, kind of maybe some oil as well. Um, so, you know, those things starting to kind of coalesce with each other. Um, somehow he makes it happen and uh, the kind of magic occurs through this kind of build up of the, of the surface thatcher. Um, so that's what always excites me about Clay's work is the mm. fact that that kind of um, you know, build up that um, it, sometimes you're not, even, you're not even aware of until you get quite close to the painting. Um, mm. And often as that intimacy of the painting, of course, drags you in close to the, to the scale of it. Mm, mm. Well, that, I mean, that's really interesting that the question of, I think, you know, stratigraphic layering of, of which is both a, it's a material thing and of course it's, it's a temporal thing too and that's operating um both formally and again symbolically for you in terms of sort of the layering of memory the layering of these sort of vestiges of of stories some hidden and and some you know uh, less so uh as well as the build-up of a surface that's that's a very interesting thing, and I remember you you speaking about intimacy um, and in relation to both that kind of stratigraphic compositional approach, but also in relation to well to scale. Um, and scale seems to be incredibly important in this group. It's something very specific about the the selection. Maybe you want to say something. Well, I, I think um, yeah, I tried to be in a way quite kind of diverse in the selection of the work, but also kind of shifting the kind of viewpoint around the space from something with a, you know, a kind of handle in it, uh, a metal handle props at the top of the painting, to something which we talked about yesterday, a kind of long band painting that mm. uh, um, you, you kind of coined yesterday with me, which I liked. Um, the kind of, I, I mean, some of the bands, I mean, one thing that sprung to my mind yesterday that one of the band's paintings that's in the show has my dad's kind of medals uh, painted onto the surface of the painting. So these little kind of um, symbolic moments happen happen in the paintings. Um, mm. Obviously, they're kind of hidden um, from any you know from, from from everybody until I explain this little little strip, uh, little mm. band is part of a bigger band um, uh, on some, on one of the the, the longer paintings. Um, mm. And then there's a little um, leather sort of washer that's kind of attached to the to the painting as well. So it just kind of upsets that sort of flatness. And um, you, I think you, that sort of focal point of the washer kind of pulls you into that to the surface. I think. Um, mm. So I'm quite interested also in something that um, always draws draws the viewer into the surface. Um, it, it, it might be something like the washer or it might be something like a um, Meccano that I've used in this painting. Um, you know, I, I guess, luckily my, my dad somehow collected Meccano as well. And um, for some <laughs> reason, and he had Meccano magazines in, in there. I, I don't know why he had them. Um, but um, he never really spoke about Meccano, but there, you know, it was all sitting there. And um, so in, in, in some of the, in this painting, I think there's, collage made up of a Meccano magazine in there, but there's also the Meccano kind of itself. And mm. Um, mm. I mean, um, I suppose it comes back to the question of how, if there's a criteria for, for how you select, mm, yeah. how you come to certain objects. Um, and I remember yesterday, we, again, we spoke about the sort of multiple functions that these obsolete signs I've called them the obsolete signs um, uh, 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 take sometimes to trigger associations and seeming to act as a kind of source or the or of the construction, the propelling an idea, and at other times um, interrupting the meaning of a story that's already uh, that you've already embarked upon. Like you were telling me yesterday about the one to your right. <laughs> Yeah, um, was a sort of in some ways a response to uh, an existing landscape, an existing environment, and then yeah, the, the, so, yeah. the one to my right is more about um, 
uh, my studio, APT, um, hmm. and um, I've been here for a long time, but um, I, I love my studio because it's quite high up and I'm surrounded by trains going past me and uh, a kind of landscape of uh, architecture that has kind of developed over a long time. Um, and the creek is just below me and I'm kind of looking onto that. And um, I wanted to make something, um, a painting which kind of had that history about this place and how that's kind of emerged as well. So the kind of structure behind me um, has a kind of um, quality of, of the, the, um, the creek itself, how the, um, the, the creek has high walls to it. And um, I wanted it to feel like you were kind of at the top of these high walls uh, in, in the painting. And, um, and then also this sense of um, geometry and windows into people's lives um, all around us as well. Um, mm. I can see, you know, pretty much into uh, <laughs> a lot of people's windows and things. But I think it's, it's a very old thing. I mean, they, I was like, oh gosh, you know, and they must see me painting you know, as well all the time. So it's a kind of strange thing going on out there and uh, trains flash past me, you know, as well. So it's, it's a, it, an odd, odd kind of thing really, but there, everything's happening about like all the time. I feel a lot of reflections as well. Mm, mm, mm. Maybe we could talk a bit more about, you know, this, what compels you to pick up certain objects and, and select them from the mass of ephemera. I think, um, I guess, you know, again, it's, it, it's kind of intuitive. Um, I'll perhaps see something on the floor or I'll perhaps see something in a wood bin um, or I'll see something um, that uh, catches my eye. You know, I think, um, I think artists are good at that. You know, they're always seeing something that catches their eye. And um, you know, it might be this, this tiny piece of wood, or it might be, a, a, as I said, a kind of a washer or a, an old piece of ruler um, or, or, or part of another tool or, or, or um, yeah, a, a form that I just, I've got a shine, it's shiny or it's got color. And it, again, I kind of think, oh, that kind of, that's, that, that might work in this. Um, so yeah, beyond, beyond the kind of collection in the garage, I think other things um, from workshops, you know, where I, where I, where I, maybe where I teach, come sliding into that, um, things that do I've they, used. Yeah, interesting. I mean, do those, do those objects from different sources, the non-garage sources, do they acquire or, or contain a different value for you symbolically to the garage objects? <laughs> um, that's interesting. I, I, I think they do, but I think it's, they all sort of contain some kind of depth of memory about places I've been or occupied for a long time. Um, I, I, I quite like kind of uh, somehow the consistency of place, you know, I, 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 I tend to stay in places a long time, I think. So, you know, um, I don't know why I just do, but um, and maybe that that then that history kind of builds up a little bit, I think, um, and perhaps um, you know you, you you were talking about Bachelard in your text and um, that sense of the past and the present um, moving together, happening at the same time, um, and I think that that that's a good way to think about it, really, although it's in the past. It's very present in my thoughts. And um, I think that really kind of shifts again the work for the viewer. I think it, I think, you know, what one could be thinking about the past, but suddenly something because of possibly narrative or history or, or an incident, you know, propels you back into the now. And, um, you know, I, I think those things are very kind of, um, phenomenologically based for me. Mm. I was I was very interested in how these the the obsolete signs, the objects function as moments of discontinuity and that, that, that introduced a rupture to the experience of 
continuous uh, motion in space and the circulation of shapes. Um, and as you said earlier, kind of actually are stopping points or stilling points um, or thresholds, uh, which is, I think, what, what brought me to thinking about what Basha says about that, the instant as a kind of collapse, but also poetics that, you know, you know, heightens the feeling of the experience of a contracted uh, presence outside of what duration can capture. So, you know, that's, uh, and then, and also calls for a, an act of kind of acute attention in turn. Um, so it's about not only, I guess, the experience that you've had and are presenting through construction, through different constructivist operations, but the experience of, uh, well, experiencing these constructions again <laughs> so how they uh how how they're registered anew by someone who actually doesn't have access to that to those memories or to that you know that particular archive no i i agree it's um it, it kind of um it's quite subtle i think how how those things uh register with with viewers or um they they might slowly register the kind of decisions in the work. Um, and I think that's quite a good thing. I quite like the way that people may spend time with the work and um, something immerses them into it. Um, you know, so often we, we rush past works, we don't stay with them. You know, it's a few seconds perhaps. But I think I'm kind of hoping that something of the that that the duality of kind of uh, actions in the work um, will, will will keep people a little bit longer. Will will create that tension so they'll um, yeah tune into it a little bit more. Um, mm. and that, I think that tuning in is something I'm quite you know captivated by. I'm trying try, trying perhaps to tune them into 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 the partly the past, but very much the, the, maybe their own present as well. Mm, mm. That's really interesting, you know, because it's, it's suggesting, I think, you know, one could come to your works and think really they are primarily about spatial explorations. You know, that's how that prim primary mode of engagement. But, you know, the t question of time is actually so, so key, it seems to me. It's I mean, so embedded in, in both the kind of roots <laughs> of the works, um, but their experiential uh, operations and mechanics, um, both in terms of obsolescence or something that's outdated. I mean, I'm interested in, in the nature of some of these objects as signs of processes that are outdated. I mean, it's difficult because they're so anonymous, but you know, some of them, you know, look either stylistically or just reminiscence of things that we no longer need or use, you know. So it's not just that they've been discarded and found like a bus ticket, you know, it's that they are outdated, they're outmoded, like Walter Benjamin said, you know, and therefore, you know. Obviously, this, this quality of the outmoded, as, as he put it, has this sort of obviously this revolutionary potential, but a potential to interrupt uh, the kind of, I suppose, habitual domains of perception um, and uh, introduce a difference that, that makes us think and experience in intensive ways. Um, I mean, I think in some ways there's this interesting crossover between, between uh, that idea of the outmoded um, and what it does to presentness and presence, and uh, this idea of the the instant <laughs> and the, the kind of discontin discontinuity, which is also the way pertains to the way you treat geometry, which I think is quite a, a particular approach to geometry. In fact, yeah, I mean, I think the circularity of the outmoded form is quite an interesting idea, isn't it? Because mm. often that outmoded um, approach or outmoded object or outmoded color or you know comes around the circle again and um, that's perhaps what shifts 
the viewer or, or others into, into the work once more. Um, that kind of quality of um, something that, that you know had a history to it. I mean, it, it, you know, it might be a particular color. It might be, it might be a kind of sap green that, that became feels feels part you know past. Um, mm. And um, how that that kind of then by introducing that that slightly outmoded color or um, something that um, we 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 once uh, loved and adored suddenly is kind of. Um, you know, placed placed in front of us again to kind of to question. Um, so I think, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in, um, I, you know, I'm sort of interested in systems, I must admit, but I think that the systems for me quite often are about choice of things like color. I mean, I often go into a paint shop, you know, an art shop, paint shop, and I just blindfold myself and just choose colors blindfolded. You know, and it's a kind of system or a thing that I do, but it, you know, it's it, it's a kind of thing that just maybe says, okay, that's that's the color I'm going to use, even you know. So it's just it's it's a blind choice, um, or uh, something I did have done for years uh, whilst making collages that often activate the paintings, um, small band collages. Um, they they um, are often made on old invitations. So I've got this thing in my head that I'm only going to use old invitations and that's why I do the drawings or the collages on. Um, and I don't know, I think they're thrown away things, but uh, hundreds of them, you know, hundreds of them, but they're great. You know, they just, it seems to me that I, I, I'm happy working on them like my old maths books at school, you know, um, I just wanted to kind of draw all over those, but it has a similar, similar kind of idea in a way. Well, I'm quite interested in in that that rule, the relation between the rule and mm. the, the kind of organicity, if I can use that word, of, of the construction. Um, did you was that the case with this group or with any of these works that there were predetermined choices and rules you followed? Only really from the, the the choices from the the blind color choice. Mm. Uh, or, or the kind of um, sense of um, that that objects I might find in the work. Um, yeah, going back going back to what I said before, objects that you know could come from my personal history or or found objects elsewhere. So I guess they always come from those kind of two sources in a sense. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, even in this painting here. There's a reference to there's, there's some text in it, which is a reference to a show that, again, the whole studio had some years ago. Um, yeah, so I, I I sometimes like to include little references that are kind of perhaps just I know about, but um, perhaps others mm -hmm. don't. But just in in that case, it's kind of a yeah, you know, it's referential to that to certain certain history and certain times again. I mean, of course, we've talked about the outmoded with respect to formal properties, um, namely color, and the outmoded with respect to the object sign. Of course, there's the outmoded with respect to genre as well, and the the very genre of construction, assemblage, um, abstraction, perhaps. <laughs> so, you know, maybe maybe you maybe you could say a little bit more about the question of that moded in your your investment of the histories of painting and an object that are I think that's great I mean I think um I curated a show some years ago um I think it's 216 or 217 um called Imperfect Reverse and um uh, I also was I, I did that in conjunction or collaboration with Saturation Point and um I think at the time I felt that Perhaps that relationship with with constructivism and geometry and systems had got a little bit kind of lost, um, and you know people weren't really looking at it as much. And um, I guess I made a little bit of a decision to kind of um, pull that back into view, particularly with that show, and. Um, so you know, so I was I, I kind of made a you know a decision to to pull in lots of um, you know, slightly older artists with 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 a really 
you know, powerful kind of uh, understanding of geometry and systems. And, and then, you know, younger artists as well, um, who were just starting to think about um, perhaps geometry and systems. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I feel that's important to me. And uh, also in the way I might write about other shows or exhibitions uh, at times um, to kind of, again, pull people back into that kind of viewpoint. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's, that's, that's a constant for me, I think, that uh, I, I'd like people to, 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 re -pull, you know, to reposition themselves, uh, to think again uh, about <laughs> things they might not have considered. But I, I, I think that's good too, because again, it you know, makes us think about perhaps painting differently and how we might kind of, um, yeah, approach it again. Um, Perhaps differently, but to, you know, with with a little bit more kind of resolve, a little bit more energy, a little bit more kind of focus um, into the work. Um, mm. Do you think about the dating of your paintings? I mean, would it? Are you interested in the possibility that it might be difficult to know when your works were made? I think that's a really interesting idea. Actually, I think. Um, yeah, because sometimes the paintings do go on for quite a long time and um and also you know like like i guess many painters but you know every now and again you you can't come back to it i just feel that um i i sometimes know exactly when they're done but then occasionally some pull you back in again and i think that that is a kind of yeah, that's when they, there's a little bit more hard one in terms of the way they might be developed. I think, um, I think, I think, I think a lot of artists who make kind of geometry in their painting and work would like a kind of um, them to almost look sort of faultless, if you like. They've kind of you know there's effortless, faultless. They kind of have this kind of, that kind of feel to them, and I I think that's that's quite because you know that they, they've taken probably. a an absolutely um, uh, yeah, extraordinary amount of kind of thinking and um, development to make the works, but sometimes you've got this this kind of faultless feel to them, and that's quite a nice. I like that trick, if you like, that they they feel kind of easy, but we we kind of know they're not. You know, it's been mm -hmm. it's been uh, yeah the the time the taken and the and the kind of decisions and perhaps the slowness of those works has, has been important. Mm, mm, mm. I mean, it's it's quite interesting. Yesterday, also, we were speaking about compulsion, or um, in terms of, you know, coming back to things. So this also complicates the question of when something is made, and I guess when it's when it when it's finished, oh, of course. But and and you were speaking quite in an interesting way about. The compulsion to return to the band paintings you know, we're calling them band paintings, band paintings yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, forever and um and that's sort of a, existing in this kind of parallel space or stream to the more what i saw as additive explorations of your construction where to quote you you know they're questions they're sort of one might even say they're sort of repeated questionings Mm. Maybe. Yeah, I suppose that kind of generative. Sorry, there's there's a sort of generative notion in the in the works in that mm. way. Um, mm. I'm, I'm often, going back to the collages, I, I make a lot of those on the on the discarded invitations, um, but then they could also kind of start to function in sort of multiples, and they might sit on top of each other, um, or they might stretch. Um, so. Yeah, I can make decisions about how those works will be seen. I, I, what I quite like about them is they could be seen in multiple ways, perhaps. Um, you know, that th they might be all stacked on top of each other, or they might be shown in a little group of eight. Um, so th these kinds of kind of more generative ideas often filter into the work, um, and I think that's that's quite exciting for me that sometimes you. Know, you you, I might make a decision to, yeah, to, to shift the way they're shown or put together. You know? I mean, that, that might make it you know, sometimes difficult to date, you know, because, because of that kind of decision uh, in the way I might play it. 
Um, yeah. But I think I like the idea that the, the work is playful. And I think that, that the games, the games that kind of artists play, I think are quite um, mm. always in the back of my mind a little bit as well. Mm. I mean, I wonder, um, Lawrence, about the way you you take apart a collection of things. So you talked, you spoke about collections of washers, collections mm. of door handles, um, and other kinds of <laughs> many collections, and. Um, I mean, maybe you have before, but uh, but not in this particular series. You know, there's we've got itemized, um, uh, you know, washers and, and and you know one or two. You know, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a set that we can yeah, delimit. Is that something, you know, that you you consciously you know you determine in advance, or have it has it ever occurred to you that this, the full set is kind of I'm picturing, you know, infinite series of packets and things that actually are limitless, that sense that you can't, there's something about the notion of this garage as being uncontainable, unrepresentable somehow in its entirety that really intrigues me. Um, so I was just wondering if you've ever sort of thought about, you know, or what, you know, the, the kind of pointed extraction from a group, how that works for you. Yeah, I think it's it's quite an odd thing. Like my my dad had also little tins of things, tins. I was I was drawn back into tins. Um, he's got an old black magic tin, um, condor tins. Um, yeah, <laughs> full of things that um, <laughs> he, he might he might he might be interested in and. Um, so in my yeah in in the studio again are lots of tins with things in. So a kind of system starts to creep in that the tin has the kind of things in that I might use. Um, and um, so so if, if that I think that's another you know quite humorous system that I kind of quite like. Mm. Uh, and so yeah it, it, yeah I guess that's one way of kind of thinking about it. I mean. He had lots of old toolboxes as well. So the toolboxes often contain packets in as well as the packets on the wall. Um, mm. So I, I kind of, yeah, a, a sort of inexhaustible thing possibly that, um, yeah, no, I, I, I think, I, think I, I can have quite a lot of, a lot of um, fun thinking about him and his kind of humor. And, uh, you know, that, that's, I think that's connected Mm -hmm. Tins, really. I mean, certainly when I see the way you use nails, nails and screws, <laughs> because sometimes it's not clear to me whether they are, whether they are found, you know, or they're part of a collection, um, or whether they are just, you know, part of the apparatus that you're using to sort of to install or something. I think, and I think that indeterminacy that possible duality is interesting because that's the moment when we're reminded of the threshold at which a tool that might have been obsolete once more require acquires a renewed function um, in, a, in a different context yeah i think it's um again i think it's it, it's it's about the kind of operation of those you know tools I think how how you know how my dad might have used them how well actually in a, in a way he he just had had them and sometimes they didn't get used you know they were just there for looking at they were just jars screwed up into the into the shelf you know you know those kind of the jar screwed into the top of the shelf and then the the, the glasses screwed into the jar and the, the nails or the screws just sit there and sit there and, you know, it's just, they're not really ever used. Pure uh, aesthetic for the aesthetic. Yeah, pure aesthetic thing. It's just an aesthetic, aesthetic mm. representation of those, of those particular screws. Yeah, they just rust away and, you know, you just, yeah, mm. little hooks. Mm. Mm, well. mm, mm, mm. Maybe the last thing we can, we can speak about, we haven't as yet is the sort of, um, the uh, again the, the sort of dual register of the sign in terms of the visual and the sonic and and how you know that works i mean we you know i i think i mentioned in the, the text your other work um deep red 
filtered pink. There's again the kind of ambivalence of the disc. I think you know as both of a sign pointing to different registers and the sonic being enfolded in the visual somehow, um, and a lost function. But also again to that aspect of memory that you mentioned at the beginning of this talk that's quite important to the genesis of, of the, the background of the works. Yeah, I think in this, in that particular painting, it's, it's probably more about, about my mum and her kind of passion for music and, um, you know, kind of voice, you know, and um, always, always singing in the house and, um, you know, uh, that, that kind of, those, those particular tunes floating in my head um, constantly, really. And um, I mean, also on that particular painting, um, she, she collected lots and lots of sheet music. So I also started to use the little geom geometric qualities of the sheet music. So if I found a piece of geometry in a sheet music, uh, that's, I started to use that in this painting. Um, and actually from that, you know, sort of period, 60s, well, 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, there's quite a lot of geometry actually in, in the work, in, sorry, in, on, on, in, the, uh, in those musical sheets. So again, I'm just pulling those out. Um, and again, you might not notice that they are, they have that kind, uh, kind of symbolism, but I think then you, still might, you might just notice the uh, parlophone or one of those kind of, um, yeah, music, musical uh, giants, you know, of, of the past, um, who, who uh, yeah, are embedded into the painting as well. And um, again, I, I, I've used in that particular painting, a kind of canvas that represents a disc. Um, I've used perspex for sort of a kind of mirrored surface, the, um, the handles kind of starts to make us think of a, again, a kind of more human kind of experience, I think, of touching a handle every day and opening the door and all that, I suppose, again. Um, yeah, I think this, this painting kind of looks at you. It's got one single kind of central, dare I say, eye <laughs> to it, but it kind of, kind of, kind of blinks at you or looks at you. And I suppose that that's, that's how I feel about the painting in a way. It, it's almost blinking or registering you. Mm. Um, so may I, yeah, I, I mean, this this sort of, I suppose that, you know, that very, very powerful triangle um, is countered again, to use your, 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 your term, the counterpoint between this cluster of circles some of which are constructions, some of which are the objects, some of which are just screw heads, <laughs> you know. Um, but they 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 pull it back um, and take the formal back into that, back through that threshold to stories, you know. Um, and then there's a kind of the visual language which is teetering towards the graphic score, which is interesting. So there's all these different. Uh, uh, sort of, yeah, stratas <laughs> to to the constructions, and um, yeah, I think it's 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 really fascinating how the obsolescence becomes a threshold that operates in multiple ways. It doesn't become a, a style that you know. There's a trope that you just repeat again and again. It, it's almost continually. Uh, uh, recast um, so it's even hard to to know what it looks like <laughs> in the end yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you noticed that anyway I, I tend not to make the same kind of well I do make a series but they have different elements to them as, as you're as you're as you're as you're talking about there so those different elements or forms or possibilities are always interesting to me um, I sometimes start with the intention of kind of creating a similar work, but I then somehow go off at a tangent and um, it starts to become less similar. And um, so that, that's what it kind of excites me 
Um, and I have made quite a lot. You know, so I'd say the handle paintings, as there's there's a few of those. Um, but um, yeah, so I guess the those those exist, but but each of them are kind of very individual. They don't have a kind of the, the structure is slightly different in them. Um, they might cons they might have a kind of a set of stairs in them, or they might in some of the others. Um, they often have they have, they often have some consistency of materials. Um, mm. Arno magazines, uh, old railway train magazine, railway collectors magazines, these kind of things that I found, but um, because they were there. But um, yeah, so those things. But they're often, and I often hide, sort of bury those within the paint as well. So there's a kind of those kind of multi layers of mm. what kind of hide me. Mm, and sealed. Um, finally, Lawrence, I guess we could just end, but but sort of saying is is there any one work in you know that is for you a sort of one that you keep returning to um or, or that has sort of acquired a particular kind of impetus <laughs> or sort of significance for you in this group? Maybe there's not, maybe they're really they're cluster. I just thought I'd ask. <laughs> um I, I I suppose actually the one we're just talking about in a way. I think I, I do get drawn back in into that particular painting quite a lot. I think because it it has such sort of significances uh, in terms of um, the, the kind of the kind of structure, the color, the kind of um, layers of of yeah, quite quite yeah you know, sad sad and melancholic memories a bit a bit melancholic. Um, a bit dramatic, <laughs> but uh, you know, I think that those things, trauma, melancholia, I think they kind of part of, they are all part of me, you know, very much. And I think that, um, yeah, I think that's why that, mm. that those things hang with me. Uh, you know, probably create, a, so I, I'm, I hope they create a kind of mystery, but I think, you know, I, I they're the things I, I probably can't. I, I don't. I choose not to shake off. <laughs> yes, you choose, yeah. <laughs> and the insistence. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's true. Well, um, thank you so much, Ryan. That was really fascinating and a real, you know, treat for me you know, to sort of probe you <laughs> and, um, you know, oh, about questions that that are also really uh, pertinent to me. And um, so, thank you. Really enjoyed that very much. Really, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. You're welcome.